Before we start, I'll begin by saying that while this podcast is being recorded on the lands of the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung and the Boonwurrung Boonwurrung peoples of the Eastern Kulin, listeners will be listening in different locations. So I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we each live and pay my respects to their elders past and present and to all First Peoples community members who are listening. Sovereignty has never been ceded. Hello, my name is May Jasper and this is the Games Week podcast, your ultimate audio guide to Melbourne International Games Week 2024. On today's episode, we're talking board games, TTRPGs, LARPs, an increasing amount of the games featured in Games Week these days are non-digital. And so today, we're talking tabletop non-stop. I'll chat with Logan Timmons from ARK and Kitty Grace from PAX about the increasing amount of tabletop games in Australia's biggest games convention. Plus, I'll talk to Nick Robertson from Mafia, the game, the show, about how to turn a role-playing game into a fringe show. I'm excited for this one, so let's skip the cutscene and get straight into it. Gang, it is Games Week's final weekend. The end is sadly looming, and so I wanted to take this maybe last opportunity to recommend a couple of events in Games Week that you might not have heard about. For example, Feminine Play. This is a curated games exhibition that celebrates femininity and subverts gendered traditions. For too long, traditional thinking has paired games with boyhood and competition and violence. Feminine play encourages a reimagining of games and play that accounts for experiences and perspectives that often go unnoticed. By curating an assortment of thoughtful games and with video interviews of game designers, this exhibition offers intersectional perspectives on femininity in games from across Australia, New Zealand and the Asia-Pacific. The exhibition is on now and continues after Games Week until the 18th of October at the Carlisle Street Art Space in St Kilda Town Hall. Also, if you go to Feminine Play tomorrow and have a passion for the niche parts of game design, you can hang around in the evening and check out Lightning Talks. Presented by Technically Games, Lightning Talks is an evening for professionals, solo devs and students alike to share in the specifics behind game design. There'll be bite-sized talks diving into the technical nitty-gritty across art, programming, security and more plus the opportunity to build connections and liaise with like-minded devs. That's on Saturday, 12th of October, from 6.30 to 9pm, also at the St Kilda Town Hall. But of course, the elephant in the room of this final weekend is PAX. The games convention juggernaut begins today, and I wanted to take this opportunity to talk about something that's a huge part of PAX, but is also a part of Games Week that sometimes gets a bit overlooked, and that is tabletop games. There are many events across Games Week focusing on analogue rather than digital games. And at PAX, the tabletop area has been growing enormously, particularly in the last few years. To get a sense of where this growth is coming from and what tabletop gamers can expect at this year's PAX, I had a chat with Kitty Grace and Logan Timmons. Kitty is the content manager at PAX and Logan is a game designer and mentor at ARC who run part of PAX's tabletop area and have been working hard to bring more people into tabletop gaming. This was a lovely chat. I'm sure you'll enjoy it. Here are Kitty and Logan. Logan, Kitty, it is so nice to chat to you guys and I'm really excited about our topic for today because we're talking about tabletop games. And I think people don't understand or know enough that Games Week has a huge component focused around tabletop games. Um, and in particular, there is a big section of packs which is focused around tabletop. Isn't that right? Yeah, we're very fortunate to have the ability to allocate so much space to the ever-growing scene that is tabletop. And as I'm sure we'll uncover while we all talk, just how the the, the scope of tabletop is so amazing. Um, mm. So yeah, it's very exciting. Yeah, it was was tabletop always a part of PAX? Tabletop has always had a component mm. um, at PAX, but you'll notice in the past, uh, we don't talk about COVID, um, in the past, <laughs> I would say, years even before COVID, um, it has really grown strength to strength, particularly in the past two years to how we've evolved it at the show mm. and how now it's weaved in so many different content areas. Um, yeah, it's just gotten larger than life and we're excited about it. Mm. 
Well, I know one of the kind of organisations that that runs part of the uh, tabletop area at PAX is ARC, and we're lucky enough to have uh, Logan Timmons here, who's a mentor at ARC and a game designer. Um, Logan, talk to me about, like, how did you become a mentor? How did you start working with ARC? Sure. So um, ARC is the Australian Role Playing Community, for anyone who doesn't know what that stands for. Um, and my particular journey began with... Um, what well, was ArcanaCon some years ago, and that's an, an old, old con that that's that's run for a long, ran for a long time, and, and no longer runs. But um, the organisation that was running that sort of transformed, especially during uh, sorry, Kitty, the COVID years, um, and um, <laughs> sort of pivoted to to where things needed to shift to, and now is the Australian role playing community. And um, as you said, May, I'm a mentor with that, um, and that's been a program that's run. We're in our third year this year. And the aim of the uh, ARC mentoring program is to help new game designers who n- have never designed a game before, a tabletop role-playing game specifically, um, create their first ever tabletop role-playing game from you know ideation to something that's actually playable and then run that at PAX and really invite in first-time designers, particularly uh, marginalized voices, voices who um, we'd really love to hear more of. So I'm talking like queer, disabled, neurodiverse, um, and POC voices. That's awesome. So the kind of ARC area, or ARC area at um, PAX, is that the main thing that you guys do is play like new cool tabletop games? Yeah, so it's mainly, so the uh, ARC at PAX area is a bunch of indie games, mainly um, Australian designed or Australian designed scenarios of other games like, um, you know, Call of Cthulhu or Vampire are very popular. And so we've had, um, yeah, from year to year, as he was saying, we we're growing how many tables we can get our hands on, running all different kinds of, of indie games, um, including some run. Some of them are brand new, like the ones from the mentors, and some of them, like you know, Vampire or others, are, are very old and, and well loved favorites. But yeah, mm. all with a an Aussie spin if we can get them. Nice. Is I mean, look, let's let's address the elephant in the room. Can I turn up and play D and D, or is that too mainstream and and uh, not not cool enough? <laughs> uh, D&D is very cool, but that's not under the ARC banner. So there is a D&D Australia um, ah, Adventurers League. Got you. They're, they're our neighbours. They're right next door. So if you come down to that area, you'll see there's a bunch of D&D tables always. And I think that that will be the case at PAX for a very, very long time. And I'm assuming there's deep beef between the, the Indies and the D&D people. Like, that's <laughs> a real... We're, gonna throw no, it we're, we're 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 pretty good friends, most. I mean, there's a lot of crossover people. A lot of people, you know, like myself included. I started with with Dungeons and Dragons, and then was really excited to explore the indie indie space. We might have, you know, some uh, some fun comedy beef, but uh, usually <laughs> we we get along pretty well. <laughs> Look, I love a comedy beef. Um, but that's, I mean, already we've talked about a, a couple of different things that are happening within the tabletop area that sound awesome. What else uh, would we expect to see within that area, Kitty? I'm particularly excited about how we've weaved tabletop into the show this year because you won't find it just in the tabletop hall, at right. Pax, which is really fantastic. So one of the things that really spurred upon, I guess, I've always been listening to what the community wants as well as being a community member, which I'm very blessed to be a part of, um, but having Eric Ishii last year as the story time speaker, um, who's just an absolutely brilliant, incredible individual, um, really showed off how hungry the community is for tabletop. So we've been making a really conscious effort to have multiple touch points of that at the show. Mm. So I feel very lucky to work with incredible organisations like ARC. So this year we have just over 40 dedicated round tables in the Tabletop Expo Hall for people to come and get involved um, in, in role play, which is so exciting. We also have over 300 tables dedicated to free play from our amazing tabletop library that we, you know, review and grow upon year on year. You'll also find tournaments. You'll also find the amazing uh, collaboratory area that we work with, with our Tabletop Design- Game Designers Association, TGGA. You'll also find, you know, the Australian Indie Showcase for tabletop designers. If you head upstairs, uh, you'll find our dedicated Owlbear Theatre, which is dedicated to 90-minute one-shots uh, <laughs> for all tabletop role-playing games, which we're so excited about. We haven't done that previously. 
And of course, we have amazing learn to plays in uh, the incredible PAX Together Lounge. And this year, we're working with two organisations, uh, the Young Adventurers League, and I believe they're called um, Cavalier Minis, um, who are running learn to play role playing for kids. So the scope that we have yeah. and that we've weaved in at the show is just massive and it really is possible thanks to the beautiful communities that we can work so closely with. That sounds awesome. God, it's a lot. I'm, I'm going to be a lot more tired. I'm, yeah. I'm going to try and get to all of these No things. excuse. There's no oh excuse for someone not to dip their toes in to mm. the incredible world that is tabletop mm. and role playing this year. Mm. I also just love, I love um, Owlbear as a concept. Always makes me so happy to see more and more people have any idea what I'm talking about when I reference an Owlbear. And obviously at PAX, that's not a problem. A, Owlbears are cute. B, obviously at PAX, it's not a problem. Everybody knows what Owlbears are. But if we can get to the point where my parents don't look me like I'm a crazy person when I talk about an Owlbear, that'd be great. Goals. Uh, Hashtag goals. Exactly. Uh, the last thing I want to touch on, we talked about a little bit with you, Logan, but I want to come back to it, is this idea of, of kind of expanding the community that is associated with tabletop games. I don't think it's controversial to say that sometimes the community around tabletop, but also just around games in general, can feel a little you know, restricted. It can mm-hmm. feel not maybe some people in the past had not felt as welcomed into kind of game spaces. And I love the work that uh, that the ASEAN ARC have done to kind of bring new people in. Can you tell me more about how that, uh, you know, how you guys undertake that process? Sure. Yeah. Thanks, May. So yeah, as you were speaking to, there is in, in games generally, there has been a very white, straight male presence historically, um, even in some of the, the earlier cons, um, the smaller tabletop game cons, um, that was that was the case. And there's lots of sort of wargaming and, and that was that um, community. Obviously, those people also deserve to play games. And there were lots of other people who wanted to be at those tables. And so particularly with um, ArcanaCon, which um, was my first con experience, there was um, when um, I think John Coleman particularly took over there was a real drive to be like, hey, there are so many other people who not only want to play games and deserve that, but also can contribute really amazing stories, voices, games, perspectives that everyone's really missing out on. Um, And so there was this, uh, yeah, very clear shift to actively invite in, hey, if you're not cishet white man, uh, we want you to run your game. We want you to run D&D or whatever. We want you to sell your wares or um, things like that. So explicitly like calling in um, other voices has been great. Um, and that has that has seen a shift as we're looking at the demographics um, of, of what art can see from, from the tables, for example, that we're running at PAX um, and other great conventions like Conquest. Conquest is another great example that's also um, really been striving to be a much uh, more diverse audience or, or meet the existing diverse audience, I should say. Um, which has been great, uh, which means that, yeah, we're seeing um, lots more uh, people who aren't men, women, and people of, of many other genders. We're seeing lots of um, neurodiverse people, um, lots and lots of queer folks. Um, uh, as someone deep in the indie saying, I don't think it's controversial to say that the best game designers are, are the queer ones who are making mm-hmm. all the good games. Um, <laughs> and so it's, it's, um, uh, it's really great to see that that is is showing up in the Australian scene as well, um, and that spaces are being are being made for that. So yeah, explicitly calling people in um, to to run games at conventions, and also through the the mentoring program as well, um, mm. and through other smaller events that ARC also runs throughout the year. There's the creative collective events where we invite um, speakers or we have discussions around various parts of the tabletop um, scene, from designing to to graphic design to marketing, all sorts of things. So by inviting um, different people to share their expertise. Um, yeah, that's that's seen a really exciting shift in the in the demographic to what's actually more accurate to what's who's out there and who's playing, which is mm-hmm. super exciting. I would love to add something to that and also give a personal thanks, uh, Logan, because the, the more you continue to shine, it really, I don't want to get emotional, but it really encourages others to shine. And this year seeing, I am getting emotional actually, because this year hey, seeing- do it. The, seeing the amount of people from queer communities put their hand up to get involved in panels or tournaments or free play, it honestly makes my heart want to burst because 
in the past, people have been really too hesitant to enter the scene. So mm. a big thank you to you, Logan, and to everyone um, in your community. Mm. And to PAX, you know, having that, that the PAX together space and having, you know, iconography and signs and flags and everything. Yeah. Team effort. We're doing it. I love all of that. Um, but we should get as emotional as possible. Um, I also, I I mean, admittedly, I'm a little biased as a queer lady myself, but I do think the the statement queer, queer people make the best games, particularly for role playing, makes this make sense to me. Because what do you 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 know, everybody playing D and D. I play a lot of D and D. Everybody coming into D and D, the first thing they want to do, they want to play outcasts. They want to be people who are maybe not as accepted by their society as they should be, who need to go out and make their own party and find their own mm. family and save the world. And you know who knows a lot about that? Queer people. I'm just saying. <laughs> I might not really... any disagreement among, yeah. amongst this group. Thank you, guys. That's so lovely. And I'm so excited for all this table stop stuff at PAX. I think this is going to be a huge, bumpy year. Um, look, you know, I uh, unfortunately, anybody who wants to come to PAX who hasn't got a badge by now, you're almost certainly n- not going to have a good time, and I really apologize about that. But I'm sure a lot of this stuff will be on the Twitch stream. Is that right, Kitty? Yeah, so three of our panels are live streamed, which is our Wombat Theatre, which we work with Generosity and we're raising um, funds for Black Dog Institute, who's uh, raised funds for mental health. We have our main theatre live streamed as well as the Quokka Theatre. And I do say definitely tune in because the amount of support we've had from developers in terms of panel content this year is absolutely bonkers. So there's going to be some really great content um, that you're going to want to tune in for. That sounds fantastic. I'm so excited to have talked to you guys. Thank you so much. Um, And uh, have a great games week. You too. Thank you. Until next time, May and Logan, take care. Thanks again to Kitty and Logan for chatting to me. I can already tell I'm going to be run off my feet trying to squeeze all of that tabletop gaming into my PAX experience. Now, one part of Games Week that we haven't touched on much in this podcast is the overlap with the Melbourne Fringe Festival. Fringe is on in late September and early October, and every year there are some great games-related shows in Fringe for Games Week peeps to check out. One of them this year is Mafia the Game the Show, which is basically an actual play of the social deduction role-playing game Mafia with comedians as the players. The evening is hosted by the show's co-creators and lead artists, Nick Robertson and Ashley Appap, and I had a great chat with Nick about the show, why lying in games is the same as lying in real life, and how they keep the audience from literally giving the game away. Please enjoy my interview with Nick Robertson. Nick, so nice to talk to you. How are you doing? Yeah, good. Thanks, May. Um, I I mean, the sun's out today, so I'm I'm having a good one. How about yourself? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I'm doing very well, and I'm really excited about Mafia, the game, the show. Um, first of all, love an overly complicated title, but this one does explain pretty much exactly what it does in the tin, which I like. Um, <laughs> in case people are not familiar, I guess, with Mafia maybe, can you give us a bit of a rundown on, on what the show is? Mafia, the game, the show. I think that is why we titled it that. It's um, based off the role-playing game Mafia and we've turned it into a show. So um, the game itself is like a social deduction role-playing game, Um, but a lot of people know it. There's so many different versions of the game. So there's Mafia, there's Secret Hitler, there's Werewolf, and I believe there's Assassin, and probably so many other names as well. Uh, But they all run down the same line of... um, there is uh, a group of, uh, for us, we have six people, six comedians that um, have all been dealt cards with different roles to play. They've been split into two teams, the mafia and the civilians, and they have an hour to try and figure out who each other are and try and not get killed uh, in each round by the mafia that are trying to uh, kill the civilians. So it's a lot of bullshitting, a lot of social deduction, a lot of jousting of wits and jokes, and hopefully um, no friendships are ruined in the process. <laughs> Only hopefully, though. You can never guarantee Hopefully. <laughs> well, I, I, it started out uh, like 
I've been playing the game forever. Like it's one of my favorite things to do. Um, back through uni, we would have a weekly sort of like games night for it. And I say, hopefully don't ruin friendships because the amount of, the amount of times that people, like we'd ended up in fights over, but you lied to me. It's, it can get really tense. Um, very, sure. um, everyone gets so involved. And I think that's why we thought it would make it, and it would be such a good game because you get so involved surprisingly so quickly. Mm. It's so well, fun. Well, the, the accusation of the accusation of you lied to me. It's like, yeah, no. This, yeah. <laughs> also, you're not a town. Sp- like, what? We're all lying. This is pretend. We're all lying. <laughs> yeah, this is make believe. <laughs> <laughs> but it just you. If for that moment, for that especially in our show, for that hour, you are in the town. It's so it's so immersive. Like you need so little to become so involved, and even like audience members who aren't playing the game at all are so invested. It's so funny to watch them like gasp as we're playing the game. It's so silly, so fun. I love it. Well, it's also, I guess, um, drawing a little bit on that thing that I always notice in in D anD D, where mm. you know. Half the skills in D&D are not something that I need to prove I can do. If I play a strong yeah. character, I don't need to then pick up a car. But if I play mm, a charming mm. character, then I need to, then it, it's sort of, it's better if I can be a bit charming in real life. And Mafia, yeah. in, it feels like it draws on that in the sense that I'm using the same muscles to lie to my friends in Mafia as I would use to lie to them in real life. And so <laughs> it can feel I'd be like, and it's been a second. A- Does that mean you've been lying to me this whole time? I've and seen it's you been pull funny. that face before. <laughs> it's been funny watching because the the pairing we've been very um strategic in the casting of the 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 casts we've had so far uh, because we want to like some to have like some of the cast members to have rapport with each other, had some sort of relationships. But then one time we had. Um, uh, a two on the panel that were dating at the time <laughs> and they were like, but I know you're lying because this is what you do at home. And we were just like, this is starting to feel a little too real for our liking, <laughs> but it does yeah. because you just become so involved. It's like, I, I, the competitive side gets unlocked. It's surprising. It's so silly. <laughs> yeah. Totally. And I love what you were saying about the audience getting involved. Um, mm. It feels like because, um, Correct me because I I know at least one version of Werewolf, which I think is similar yeah. to Mafia. Yeah, where, yeah, pretty um, much exactly the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and in Werewolf, you know, you have like kind of a daytime thing where everybody's talking to each other, and then you have a nighttime phase mm. where everybody closes their eyes, and then the bad guys open their eyes and decide who they're going to kill. Right? This is kind of yeah. how it works. Yeah. Yep. And I'm assuming when you play the game in front of an audience, the audience gets to see that bit. How like how do you stop the audience from kind of giving it away does that ever happen or what happens well actually that was the thing we've changed about the game for the show because the audience we don't have huge audience interaction with the show but the audience are part of the show in the sense that they get the final vote so the whole show the audience aren't privy to who's who um, oh. We all keep that under guys. We um, are very secretive throughout the show because um, when we get down to the final two, um, the audience decide who survives. So do, we, there's a do? lot of measures in place to yeah. keep things secretive. Cover of night time. So there's a, a few theatrics involved. Um, oh. And my daughter, who loves to speak to the dead, comes to play in the night time. So she <laughs> she's the one that uh, does a lot of sleight of hand and a lot of distractions as I try and figure out what's going on. Right. So this is, just to be clear, this is not your real-life daughter. This is the other co No. <laughs> no. This <laughs> is, <laughs> as town mayor, I'm speaking as town mayor at the moment, my daughter comes out at night. So yeah. Ash, the other co-host, she yes, comes yes. Uh, we've, and that's how we've sort of split the roles of, for co-hosting in the sense of I'm very much gameplay, trying to keep mm. everyone on task and keeping like I'm the one that decides like, well, passes on information of who's dying, who sees who and that sort of stuff. And Ash is the one that comes and plays with them um, uh, and keeps the show rolling on the night time. So have some banter between the the fallen mem- cast members um, to keep that, you know, the improv, the spirit alive as we get the gameplay going. So 
yeah, we've we've really been so like we've I think that's the biggest task from our end of like the amount of work that we've put into being like, okay, we've got this game. How do we make it a show and how do we keep things secret whilst keeping it entertaining and keeping the audience involved? Because I know that there's a lot of like gameplay um, shows out there, like the D&D shows that, you know, people love just watching, uh, just watching things roll out. But I think for this one, I think it was so important that uh, the audience, sh- like we felt that the audience should be involved just slightly that because like the twists and turns along the way, I know like anytime we would listen to um, a true crime podcast or the, or an Agatha Christie book, it's that reveal at the end that is always the most juicy, this most satisfying thing. So that's what we really wanted to um, come through in this show. So yeah, that's why we're like, got to keep it secret. <laughs> Absolutely. I think that's great. What a cool, yeah. and it just means that, you know, because other uh, actual plays, if this is kind of an actual play, you know, it's mm. very difficult for the audience to be involved in the same way that the players are because the kind of play that they're doing is very complicated and requires a lot of yeah. rules and, you know, pieces of paper and nonsense. This is yeah. just, again, it's the same muscles you use to tell if somebody in real life is lying to you, but now you can use them in a theatre. Amazing. And that's um, why I'm like saying, like the gar- hearing an audience gasp is one of the most satisfying me. things I have ever heard. Like I'm a comedian and I love to make people laugh and, you know, I need people's affirmation and validation, but nothing is more satisfying to hear from an audience member is a gasp during a mafia game. It is <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Now, I know you have different comics who come along and play with you uh, in the game. Uh, can you tell us anything about the comedians that are going to be in for the shows over the next little while? Yeah, um, we're super excited about the cast that we've had uh, we've got for um, this run of shows um, because, I mean, the more we play this game and uh, do this show, the more word spreads about how much fun it is for the comics to play. So we're slowly getting like bigger and bigger acts to come join us. Mm -hmm. So uh, for Fringe, we've got a bunch of like the Thank God You're Here cast, like the cast ensemble coming to join us, which is super fun. So because it's one of those things that like, even though you don't need to have improv skills to play the game, having some strong improv, like trained improv artists on the panel just makes for more fun and creates a better atmosphere for the other stand-ups, for example, who aren't really strong in the improv field. Um, so having them bounce off each other is great. So we've got a bunch of, yeah, the Thank God You Hear cast members, I think are the biggest things that we're super excited to see what they play with. But we've got some of like some heavy hitters from like, uh, we've got like the Melbourne Comedy Festival's uh, most recent Best Newcomer winner joining us this year, Noah Sito, which we're super excited about. Then there's like Hannah Camilleri, um, who's an incredible, like she's a Pinder Prize winner at the Melbourne Comedy Festival last year. She's one of the most skilled and funny and just bonkers character comics. Um, so we've just got this massive mix of improv artists who are great at throwing suggestions at each other, stand-ups who are just so witty, so funny, and then the character comics who I'm just so excited to see if they, you know, do they come in character, do they come dressed up, at, or are they We're going to see some stuff made up on the spot just for mm. tonight, for the nights that we're doing. It's one of the most exciting things about the show, just seeing how people take on their role. It's so yeah. fun. Yeah. Oh, I mean, it sounds like a great time. I'm really looking forward to coming along. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me and uh, have a great Fringe. Have a great Games Week. Thank you so much, May. Thank you for taking the time to talk Mafia. I love talking Mafia. Thanks so much to Nick for chatting to me. And if you want to catch Mafia, the game, the show, this Fringe, you've only got a couple of opportunities left. They've got shows on October the 11th, 12th and 18th at Trades Hall. And you can find details on the Fringe website or at gamesweek.melbourne. If you can't make those dates, all is not lost. There are plans in the works for more seasons of Mafia the Game the Show, and you can follow Nick on Instagram at Nick Mick Picks to hear about future seasons. Okay, folks, that's it for this episode of the Games Week podcast. Thanks again to my guests, Logan Timmons, Kitty Grace, and Nick Robertson. If you want to find out more about any of the Games Week events we've mentioned today, head to our website, gamesweek.melbourne. 
The Games Week podcast is hosted by May Jasper, that's me, and edited by Derek Myers. Woo-hoo! We're produced by Creative Victoria and Melbourne International Games Week and distributed by Games Hub. See you Monday.